Good at uh, todos, señores y señores, señoras, y uh, sean todos bienvenidos a Casa Común para este lanzamiento libro Utopian Possibilities, Models, Theories, Critiques. And welcome to Casa Común for uh, the book launch tonight. You're all very welcome to those here in Casa Común and also to all those uh, watching um, live via YouTube. Um, my name is uh, Liam Benson. I'm a researcher in privacy and utopianism at, um, the, um, at the University of Porto at the Centre for English Translation and Portuguese Studies. Um, I also work at uh, the University of Verona um, and um, I'm a member of the uh, uh, affiliated scholar at the um, uh, Centre for Privacy Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Um, just a couple of housekeeping um, uh, points before we begin, um, and I'll, um, the, um, the, um, our session is being recorded, as I've just said, via YouTube. Um, however, the camera is all focused on us on stage, so I promise no one in the audience will be, um, will be uh, picked up on camera, but um, just, uh, just to let you know that this first session will be recorded. Then um, we will watch a film and then we'll have a general discussion at the end, and but that none of that part will be recorded. Um, thank you, everyone, for for coming. I'd like to um, thank, in particular, um, a couple of thank yous before I begin. Um, thank you, in particular, to Professor Fatima Vieira um, for making this event possible. Fatima is uh, the director of New Porto Press and vice rector for culture at the University of Porto. Um, and uh, without Fatima's support, this uh, book um, and, and this launch would not be, would not be possible tonight. And if you're watching Fatima, a big hug and a big thank you very much for supporting this book project and also for um, personally for your support for my work over many, many years. I'm also like to thank uh, Paola Carvalho from uh, U Porto Press for supporting this um, this um, launch, and also for um, to Inés and Elena from Setup for uh, um, taking care of all the um, organisation and the technical um, uh, details to make this launch possible. I'd also like to thank um, Dario Teixeira um, for agreeing to. Um, make this uh, our event a part of um, his Thousand Books Club. Um, and it's wonderful to see members of the club, friends um, here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, now I'd like to um, introduce you to my colleagues here on stage for our little uh, our discussion tonight. Um, on my right, I have uh, Jose Eduardo Reich. Um, Eduardo is Associate Professor in Literary Studies at the University of Trados Montes in Alto Douro um, and a researcher in the Margarida Loza Institute of Comparative Literature in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Porto. Uh, he has published extensively on literary utopianism, is a member of the editorial boards of several um, academic journals, is a contributor to Colloquial Lectures, the Gulbenkian uh, Journal of Literary and Cultural Studies, and a reviewer for the International Utopian Studies Journal. Um, and on my left, I have uh, Christina Gill. Um, Christina is adjunct, adjunct invited professor at the Scuola Superior de Educação at the Polytechnic Institute of Setúbal. She is also a member of the Centre for the Study of Communication and Culture at FCH Católica de Lisboa, where she founded the Deaf Studies Lab. Um, in her doctoral research, she coined the term deftopia to refer to representations in utopian discourses in deaf communities and among people who use sign language around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, a, it's lovely, wonderful, really a, a great pleasure to have both of you, two of the contributors to the book, to help um, launch um, our work tonight. Um, so, um, First, I'm going to give a little overview of um, of the book and the and its aims, and then um, uh, Jose Eduardo and Christina will talk a little bit about their contributions, and then uh, we'll watch the film. So, um, 
This book, uh, Utopian Possibilities, Methods, Theories and Critiques, is a book of um, many hands and many minds. Um, it br brings together the research of uh, 40 contributing uh, scholars um, who uh, um, have written 38 essays that address um, the topic of utopian possibilities from a whole range of different perspectives. Um, the contributors are very varied. We're just a small representative of the, the 40 contributors here. Um, um, and But the expertise of the um, contributors include um, um, scholars in political science, history, anthropology, sociology, law, AI and gaming, education, environment, art, architecture, and uh, deaf culture. Um, and what do we mean by utopian possibilities? Um, the aim of this book was to take a fresh look at a variety of utopian models, theories, proposals and movements for reform, for social reform, and subject them to critical analysis. We wanted to um, question the value of various utopian models in terms of their effectiveness in um, um, helping to realize uh, social changes in the real world, and to assess the value and limitations of the utopian imagination in achieving uh, real social change. Um, and interacting with discourses of power in the real world. Modern utopianism treads a fine line between the possible and the impossible, between what might be and what isn't. Paul Tillich wrote that every utopia is a hovering, a suspension between possibility and impossibility. Um, Fatima Vieira credits Thomas More with the creation of this unique tension between the possible and the impossible. It comes from the word utopia itself, coined by Thomas More, which, mean, which is a pun meaning both a no place and a good place. Hence, utopias um, are simultaneous, simultaneous, no, simultaneously nowhere, but also um, are possible. Um, so this tension, um, characterizes modern utopianism and differentiates it from earlier dreams, dreaming, forms of dreaming of a better society, which um, lack this tension or the, lack the real sense of possibility. Utopian ideas should therefore always, always be grounded in a social reality. And this is perhaps the most important answer to those uh, like um, Karl Popper and many others over the centuries who have criticized utopianism uh, for being a uh, uh, sort of um, uh, mere fantasy. Um, utopian ideas, utopian ideas are grounded in social tri tri um, critique and attention um, that um, always aspires to stretch the limits of the possible. Um, so I'd like to give you a couple of examples about some of the um, of some of the um, many uh, the diverse essays that um, be published in this book. Uh, many of the essays uh, cover um, literary utopias, of course. Um, um, we have, um, for example, a feminist critique of George Orwell's 1984, a discussion of a uh, recent adaptation of 1984 as a self-navigating visual novel. Um, a scholar, Gabrielle Hart Hartwig, this takes a look at how the English Robinson Crusoe is being translated and adapted in many different ways into Hungarian literature. There's an essay on the dystopian implications of post-traumatic stress, memory and identity in the Hunger Games. And also in, uh, in the main swimmer. And there's an essay um, by Divya Singh, which examines how Indian novels on caste politics highlight utopian uh, aspirations for social change amongst the Dalit communities of India. Several essays also address, address the, the potentialities of the of, um, contemporary digital uh, realm. Tom Bradshaw's um, timely essay just deconstructs the ideologies and assumptions that underpin many of our um, um, uh, expectations about uh, the utopian possibilities of digital technologies. 
um, Elenia uh, Vittoria Casmiri's essay on Kazu Isuburu's Clara and the Sun, um, and Dana uh, Svarova's essay on contemporary sci-fi, explore some of the ethical and emotional um, implications and questions that we will all face as AI becomes a bigger part of our lives. Um, there are also several historical essays on historical aspects of um, utopianism. Francesca Russo um, looks at um, the notion of the perfect republic in uh, the Renaissance humanist Antonio Buccioli. Um, Annalita Gavalloni discusses uh, international socialist workers' tradition of council communism, which is a 19th century development inspired by um, people like Sylvia Pankhurst and Antonio Gramsci, which um, 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 proposed a, a, a model of communism that would count, counter that um, used in the Soviet Union. Um, others like um, Albert Gershel have written about um, the development of, um, of uh, forms of hygienic um, uh, utopianism during the 19th century when ideas of hygiene were becoming um, more and more prevalent around the world. I should say something about my own essay, um, um, which um, looks at shifts in notions of privacy um, in the early modern period between Thomas More's Utopia, which was first published in 1516, and the first Dutch Utopia published about 200 years later um, in, uh, in 1708. Um, Privacy has long been um, a paradox at the heart of utopian thinking, um, as in many later works, both privacy and private property are abolished in Moore's Utopia. But Moore himself opines that the idea of communal living is absurd. And yet, so Moore is sort of having his cake and eating it too. But by making his um, utopia a communist society, he set up a long history of attempts to actually make realize this, um, this, this idea in, in, in practice. Um, so such attempts to make the non-existent desirable possible in reality will provoke strong resistance from entrenched social forces, of course. And I think, and this is what um, Tom Moylan refers to as utopia's negative function. Because utopias must break through structural and ideological barriers if they are to really change our society in a, in a, in a real way. Two essays in our book outline the historical fate of realized utopian movements that were crushed by the forces of social power, of state power, sorry. Um, Marcel, uh, uh, Michel Macedo Marques discusses the 20th century community of Calderal de Santa Cruz do Deserto in Brazil which combined messianism, ecology, and socialism um, in the community, but was eventually suppressed as being a threat to the state. And Jelen Unlu um, traces how the Turkish state manipulated and suppressed the memory of a wave of utopian progressive politics which arose in Turkey during the 1960s and 1970s. So I think we can see from these examples the diversity of, um, of um, essays that we have in the book. Even when they fail, utopias can offer important knowledge and examples that might inspire future efforts for social change. As we face a rising tide of political reaction and unreason in our own world, it is important to be mindful of such historical examples and to know both the through both the repression that utopians may face when um, struggling to change the world, um, but also to gain knowledge of past experience that might uh, help us find um, new possibilities for change at the same time as we gain courage from previous examples of um, progressive struggle. Finally, I'd just like to say that as um, editor of the book, um, it was something of a utopian project to bring together so many diverse and uh, interesting um, essays, but it was also a, a wonderful, rare and um, um, exciting opportunity to um, get to know the work of so many um, interesting scholars uh, more intimately. Um, and uh, so that was a great pleasure for me and a learning experience.
Um, I think the breadth of, and diversity of the essays in the book, just, although I say it myself, I'm the editor, um, makes a, a fair representation of the diversity of utopian studies in general, of the, the field of utopian studies in general, although, of course, it's necessarily a small representation of the field as a whole. Um, but um, it does represent the field's openness to diverse perspectives and to trying to um, bridge um, disciplinary and cultural and linguistic boundaries. Um, in the end, I hope that the book will appeal um, both to readers of um, utopian uh, uh, literature and uh, sci-fi and dystopianism, as well as furnish um, scholarly discussions for scholars and students um, in the field. Um, and with that, I think I'd like to um, hand over now to um, Jose Eduardo to say something about um, his um, contribution and uh, well, his possibilities. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Blaine. And thank you for inviting me also. Uh, thank you, Fatima. I think Pareto also, if you also see me, accept my gratitude. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to speak about my own paper. I'm going to deliver a few thoughts from Utopia that uh, I think maybe they are a valid contribution to this discussion. So I collected a few ideas about my own research and my, my own approach to utopia, the concept of utopia and utopianism. And um, this text somehow is um, reflecting my own contribution to this uh, very interesting area of uh, interdisciplinary studies that is called Utopian studies. Okay, so as an imagined no place, polysemic concept of utopia manifests itself through a network of philosophical principles, ethical values, political aspirations, or existential desires of those who conceive, design, or invent it. As a result, it can be studied in an interdisciplinary fashion using discrete dialogical approaches. And I think this book is showing that right now. Therefore, it is important to show how the concept of utopia can be applied in different fields of knowledge. In 1976, Leonard Bernstein, you know, composer, conductor, psychologist, taught a series of six classes at Harvard titled The Unanswered Question on the technical aspects and future of Western classic music. And in these classes, he applied Chomsky linguistic hypothesis on the cognitive origin of human language to support the idea of an innate musical competence on the planet Risca. Bernstein's thesis suggests that just as individuals have an inherent ability for language, they also possess an inborn musical competence that allows for universal human expression. Following this idealistic line of thought, it is reasonable to suggest that humans possess a cognitive inclination to envision better worlds, create utopias, expand the scope of actual possibilities, and remove biased perceptions, resulting in conflicts, injustice, and suffering in our world. It goes without saying that this monogetic hypothesis does not imply uniformity or model uniqueness in the creation of situations, scenarios, or idealized worlds. Drawing inspirations from the Chomsky hypothesis, of innate language competence, the guiding principle of Bernstein classes is that music can be analyzed and performed according to three parameters that are related to the three branches of linguistics. Phonology, the study of sounds, syntax, the arrangement of phrases, and semantics, the study of meaning. By employing, by employing this threefold methodological framework as an analogy, one could argue that while the term utopia is universally recognized in terms of its phonological realization, I think everyone agrees that there is this word utopia that is worldwide known, its syntax usage 
had historically and culturally varied greatly, whereas its semantic interpretation fills a wide range of possible and many times contradictory meanings. In general, the essays in the book Utopian Possibilities show not only a wide range of semantic variation, but also a constructive assessment of the concept of utopia. However, they do so with the assumption that its cross-historical and multi-form discursive views, fictional, philosophical, social, political, architectural, is not free of tensions and shadows regarding the seemingly benign assumption of its field of knowledge and action. In fact, the political climate of the 20th century exacerbated, if not distorted, its positive value with the positive value of the concept of utopia. Both during that century, 20th century and the previous writing, there were many qualified critics who opposed utopia for two main reasons. Firstly, it was regarded as a deceptive form of idealization that did not accurately represent the material conditions of human life in historical and social context, as argued, for instance, by Karl Marx. And secondly, it was a totalitarian model of closed society that completely eradicated any form of individual freedom, as argued by Karl Popper, as you mentioned, Isaac Berlin, Anna Arendt, and others. But other prominent thinkers, such as Hans Bloch, Martin Buber, Hultil, defended its auspicious value. The ongoing debate upon about the usefulness of the concept of utopia, and I quote from Ruth Levitas, as the expression of desire for a better way of being, does not ignore its potential for self-criticism. But despite facing challenges in practical application, utopia remains a valuable method for evaluating various areas of knowledge, including literature and numerous other cultural knowledge. Ruth Lepitus brought back the theological idea of grace to elucidate the profound and extensive nature of intentional utopian expression in different areas, such as ontology, art, painting music, and sociology. This she well, this was maybe in, in, in the book, not so the concept of utopia, but the method of utopia. Levitas acknowledged in the concept of grace, as articulated by Paul Tillich, the ordinary experience of gratitude and gift, I quote, which transforms both our relationship with ourselves and our relationships with others. End of quote. The concept of grace suggests a unifying energy or capacity for creative relationships, revitalizing the diverse and interdisciplinary concept of utopia, particularly when linked with the contradictory and historically justified notion of disenchantment. Claudio Magris writes that disenchantment I quote, is a form of hope that moderates optimistic views by acknowledging dark possibilities in history. In fact, the quote is longer and it says, disenchantment is an ironic, melancholic, and fierce form of hope. It moderates the prophetic and generously optimistic pathos that deliberately underestimates the terrifying possibilities of regression of this discontinuity of the tragic barbarism latent in history. Magris had undoubtedly read or been aware that the principle of hope is the title of Hans Bloch, the magisterial work in which he reflects deeply and systematically on the concept of utopia by establishing the link of correspondence between the effective logic of that principle, hope, and the phenomenological scope of that concept. The concept of hope. 
without ignoring the negative consequences of unhuman and totalitarian conceptions of utopia. My piece provides this necessary semantic pragmatic update in order to reemphasize the perennial, perennial sense of its liberating and sublimating potential. And I quote again. This enchantment, which corrects utopia, reinforces its element fundamental hope. Hope does not come from a reassuring and optimistic vision of the world, but from the uncovered torture of lived and suffered existence that creates an indescribable need for redemption. The terms grace and disenchantment have opposite meanings, but when connected to the apparatic concept of utopia, they create endurably protective effects on a wide range of ontological, epistemic, political, aesthetical, literary domains. That's why we call upon them to enlarge the functional, intellectual, cultural, and spiritual significance of the utopian possibilities. So that's my contribution. And I hope that you understand a little bit. It's a little bit heavy effects, but it's, it's what I try really to connect here is these two opposing concepts of utopia as uh, say positive idealization of a better world with this more human uh, experience of being disenchanted using color by peace, reasoning of utopia. And I think this is very productive to keep on studying, to keep on believing in the positive aspects of utopia. So that is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's really interesting because the um, this idea of enchant I think this is the this the idea of enchantment links us to the to the to the world of the now, right? Because that's where we that's where we're going to be disenchanted by current social and political conflicts. But um, yeah, so, so it's no yeah. choice. I, I found that of course my piece is not someone that that is an expert on utopian studies, not at all. But uh, uh, I, I, well, I, I read his, his famous book on the Cerebra, and it's very beautiful. And in fact, he has, is also a great essayist, and he has this interesting, interesting uh, essay on utopia. But he, he chooses utopia from an historical perspective, of course. So he, when he's talking about this enchantment, is not because he wants just to oppose to joke in mind with a negative uh, look, with a negative interpretation of what it means utopia. It's of course based on historical experience. Mm -hmm. And I think in the 20th century, or the 21st century, in fact, he wrote this in his essay, I just guess. We can no longer believe in utopia as. Uh, just bright, without that, as, as a bright uh, alternative reality that one can live in. And by now, as you know, that, that happens quite often in the, in the conferences that I attend already for many years. I even suggested already to uh, Gregory Place to change the name of the Utopian Study Society to the Utopian Study Society because most of the Nowadays, most, and I, I, I started attending these conferences, I think the first time it was in 1999, so still at the end of the 20th century. And most of the papers, the first time I attended this conference, they were really about it. Now, lately, as you know, I, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, I still am perhaps one of the few who still talks a little bit positively about the topic because. Most of the papers that are presented there are about dystopias, which of course reflects the state of affairs. Mm -hmm. So my contribution was to give some kick <laughs> to this, uh, uh, I mean, to, to the reflection to this false of Turkey, which of course is, is a very uh, broad field of knowledge that uh, yeah, is reflected in this book. I think this book is, is updating a lot of debates that are going mm -hmm. on. I think that it's also such um, um, picks up on the arc of the book, I suppose, because many of the 
essays maybe began with uh, a more positive beginning on, with the idea of the, you know, the hopefulness of utopian possibilities. But then um, we have um, the, the book finishes with a reflective essay by Tom Moylan, yeah. which um, sort of um, um, is, a, is a cautionary essay for, not to get too carried away with the, the positive aspect and to realise that utopianism must have this, this negative side um, which connects to the to the real conflicts of, of our world. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this is necessary to uh, it's like reaffirming the negative dimension of utopian press, but it's not emphasizing the dystopian stories, but in fact it's it's is uh, well basically he's using this concept that I think is came from Frederick Jameson. And I just got to quote from Frederick Jameson, but I, I need to read this, this uh, essay by Jameson. But I, I quote it from Moylan, who quotes Jameson. And Jameson, who is a Marxist and a great contributor for to, to studies, I think he wrote this still in the 90s. And he says something like this The deepest vocation of utopia is to remind us of our constitutional <laughs> ability to imagine utopia itself. This is very interesting. We can have all kinds of dreams, but he says the deepest vocation is not to frame what we took. So he's, he's giving space, he's opening the concept of utopia by saying so. And then he says, and this is not due to any individual failure of imagination, but as a result of the systematic, cultural, and dialogical closer of which we are all in. Uh, in one way or another, prisoners. So we acknowledge that we are somehow limited to the sphere of perception of the world we live in, and that somehow also conditions the possibilities of imagining other worlds. So this utopian negativity that uh, the Twin Moyland is stressing is perhaps very much needed, especially for those who believe in utopia. Otherwise, we can end up in what, what happened at uh, the times in the historical moments we end up with the stories. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, now um Christina, um would you like to talk about um, some contribution? Of course. Just good evening everyone here and online. I would like to thank uh Professor Fatima. I thought I was going to meet her again, but I uh, hope I'll meet her next time. And thank you, uh, Professor Liam, for editing uh, such 38 uh, authors and such a diverse uh, kaleidoscope uh, of the, the current affairs in Utopian studies and for bringing us together here to launch the book. So my chapter is entitled Deftopia, Utopian Representations and Community Dreams by Sign Language Peoples and is the result of a synergy of culture studies, utopian studies, and deaf studies. Deftopia explores a utopian and dystopian representations by sign language peoples through the deaf-led cultural productions. This encompasses narratives from diverse sources like artwork, film, one of which we are going to watch here, um, literature and visuature, which is literature in sign language, activism, shared sign language communities, political efforts such as demonstrations and political manifestos. Deftopia allows for multiple perspectives, including narratives of a hopeful future for deaf culture, as well as manifesting pertinent and critical viewpoints on the history of oppression against deaf people and warnings of potential and current and future threats. So, brings both sides, it's not only dystopian. <laughs> the analysis of the paradigms, models, narratives, counter-narratives and discourses allow an overview of utopian and dystopian possibilities that this chapter highlights bringing awareness to deaf culture, but also contributing to its discussion and preservation. And I Style, but that's what's been most concise. Very concise. Yes. Of course, we can read um, more about Christina's um, um, contribution in the book, and also we, we're going to. Um, um, so the film that we're going to we'll, we'll also, that we're going to see shortly will also cover this um, um, field of depth depth studies. 
and then afterwards we can maybe have a more couple of conversation about um, issues that, um, that, that the film raises for utopian possibilities and such studies in particular. Did you answer? So, yeah, would you like to introduce So, to introduce the film. The short film we are about to watch is entitled The End, and it was written and directed by Ted Evans, a deaf British director. The End is a powerful docufiction that spans a 60-year period and introduces a simultaneously utopian and dystopian drama, depending on your cultural background. So the film was surprisingly made with just 4,000 pounds under the British Sign Language Broadcasting Trust within the Zoom short film scheme, and has gone to screen at international film festivals worldwide, picking up nine awards to date. Awards in the United Kingdom, in the United States of America, in Sweden, Italy, Switzerland, and France. The end is accessible to both deaf and hearing audiences and includes several topics that are under discussion in deaf studies, such as deaf education, biopower and biopolitics, the right to be born, and the right to have one's language and identity. Without any spoilers, and regardless of your hearing and deaf status, the end invites to audiocentric audiences to cross their cultural bias and boundaries. Thank you, Christina. Obviously, and the, the film will not be screened uh, by YouTube. It's just for, for us to view here in the audience. But I'd like to thank the all the viewers on YouTube very much um, for joining us 